Here's the brief news from the world over this week. As we reported first earlier today, the long dispute over the remains of Archbishop Fulton Sheen has finally come to an end. The New York Supreme Court on Thursday ordered the New York Archdiocese to release Archbishop Sheen's body to Peoria, Illinois, immediately. Sheen, who died in 1979, is buried in the crypt of St. Patrick's Cathedral in Manhattan. New York was unwilling to release the body so Sheen's sainthood process could continue. It is customary that the remains of a saint be interred where the sainthood petition was filed, in this case, Peoria. After the New York Archdiocese refused to release Sheen's body, his relative, Joan Cunningham, begged the court to compel them to release the body to Peoria so the canonization effort could continue. Sheen's remains will be interred in a marble crypt built near the altar at St. Mary's Cathedral in Peoria, where the El Paso native was ordained a priest. If canonized, Sheen would be the first American-born bishop to reach sainthood. With Inauguration Day a little more than two months away, Team Trump is hitting the ground running. While President-elect Donald Trump vets potential cabinet picks from New York's Trump Tower, Vice President-elect Michael Pence met with House Republicans on Capitol Hill on Thursday. According to House GOP leaders, the president-elect is seeking a short-term spending bill to keep the government running through March of next year. The current stopgap spending measure runs out on December 9th. Such a move would give next year's Republican-controlled government time to consider a boost in military spending, Trump's trillion-dollar infrastructure proposal, and potential cuts in other domestic programs. More on the Trump transition in our next segment. And one-time Democratic candidate for president, Bernie Sanders, is calling for a new direction for the Democratic Party. The Vermont senator said at a D.C. rally on Thursday that Donald Trump's victory in the presidential race was, in fact, a failure for Democrats. When you lose the White House to the least popular candidate in the history of America, when you lose the Senate, when you lose the House, and when two-thirds of governors in this country are Republicans, it is time for a new direction for the Democratic Party. Sanders said the Democrats need to recognize what Donald Trump recognizes, namely that there are millions of working class, middle class, and low income people who are living in despair. Moving overseas, it was another week of deadly airstrikes in the besieged city of Aleppo. Another hundred deaths have been reported as Russian and Syrian government forces continued to pound what they say are rebel held positions. Airstrikes on Wednesday struck the city's central blood bank, a children's hospital, and another surgical center. A water treatment plant was also hit this week. This year alone, 126 medical facilities have come under attack, according to the World Health Organization. Months of negotiations between the U.S. and Russia have failed to cement a long-term ceasefire between the forces of Syrian President Assad and the rebels fighting to topple him. And a high-level U.N. climate change conference got underway in Morocco this week. The talks are the continuation of last year's Paris Accords, which sought to stop the warming of the Earth's climate. Nations are a bit nervous about U.S. participation in the agreement in the wake of Donald Trump's victory. The president-elect has referred to climate change as a hoax and promised to cancel U.S. involvement in the agreement. On Wednesday, U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry assured the assembled that the U.S. would continue to fight global warming and that an overwhelming majority of Americans believe climate change is real. Pope Francis also weighed in on the matter. In a statement released in advance of the conference, the Pope said the international community has a, quote, serious ethical and moral responsibility to act without delay to fight global warming. And four prominent cardinals went public this week with a controversial letter asking Pope Francis to clarify certain points included in his apostolic exhortation on the family, Amoris Laetitia, 
The letter was originally sent in September, but since the Pope has yet to answer their concerns, the Cardinals released the letter to the press. Cardinals Raymond Burke, Carlo Cafara, Joachim Meisner, and Walter Brandmuller asked Francis for clarity on communion for divorced and remarried Catholics. The high-ranking cardinals say they were, quote, compelled in conscience by our pastoral responsibility to press Pope Francis to clear up matters of uncertainty and confusion that have occurred since the exhortation on the family was released. Moreover, Cardinal Burke said if the pope doesn't definitively clarify church teaching on this matter, then tradition allows for the correction of the Roman pontiff. More on this in our next segment. And in a rare video speech given in English, Pope Francis offered praise for the Catholic Church in the U.S., singling out its outreach to Latino immigrants and the specific gifts that Hispanic Catholics have offered. The Pope spoke on Tuesday to the U.S. bishops meeting in Baltimore. Our great challenge is to create a culture of encounter which encourages individuals and groups to share the richness of their traditions and experience, to break down walls, walls, and to build bridges. We are called to be bearers of good news for a society gripped by disconcerting social, cultural, and spiritual shifts at increasing polarization. Meanwhile, the full body of the U.S. bishops openly endorsed a statement that both congratulates President-elect Donald Trump and assures migrants and refugees that the bishops remain in solidarity with them. The statement was drafted by the chair of the bishop's committee on migration. It said that it is their prayer that the Trump administration recognizes the contributions of migrants and immigrants to the overall prosperity and well-being of the country. And the U.S. Bishops' Conference also elected new leaders this week. Cardinal Daniel DiNardo of Galveston, Houston, will be the new USCCB president. And Archbishop Jose Gomez of Los Angeles, a member of Opus Dei, was elected vice president. Some church observers say these picks may indicate a response to Pope Francis's decision to make progressive archbishops, Blaise Supich of Chicago and William Tobin of Newark, cardinals in the consistory in Rome this weekend. And there are rumors and reports of some extraordinary phenomena taking place at Christ's tomb. Workers engaged in a restoration project at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem have reported a sweet aroma emanating from the open tomb, a floral scent. Curiously, in 1809, during the last opening of Christ's tomb, a chronicle also makes mention of a sweet scent. Separately, workers have also reported that some electronic devices left near the tomb began to malfunction or cease to work altogether, suggesting that there had been a powerful electromagnetic force present. Observers and reporters at the site are short on answers that would explain the strange occurrences. Hmm. And one of public television's most well-known journalists, Gwen Ifill, died following a battle with cancer on Monday. She was 61. Eiffel was the longtime co-host of the PBS NewsHour and noted debate moderator for several campaign seasons. Our thoughts and prayers go out to Gwen's family and friends. May she rest in peace. And with Christmas just around the corner, remember my new Christmas project, Christmas Time in New Orleans. The original soundtrack with splendid new jazz arrangements of Christmas favorites is available from the EWTN catalog, as well as Amazon and wherever CDs are sold. And the Christmas Time in New Orleans PBS special airs after Thanksgiving. But the extended cut DVD is available now from Amazon and other retailers. Go check it out.